went to the temple, or actually the synagogue in Capernaum, and there was a man with an unclean spirit. I was wondering, what do you do to get an unclean spirit? Uh, how does that happen to somebody? And, and uh, it uh, literally means unclean. It's outside of, uh, of being clean. It's dirty. It's soiled. It's uh, polluted somehow. What, what brings that upon a person? And so I turned to Leviticus, which seems to codify all these things. And I was concerned about whether I would be presenting myself to you today as uh, someone who was clean or unclean. And uh, the natural first thing I would look at is, well, what did you eat? Some of us are obsessed about our diets, and, and there are times when we deviate from the right diet and we feel guilty or embarrassed or frustrated or whatever it is. But I thought I would run through the checklist quickly and find out if I had anything to eat yesterday that would put me on the bad list. And, uh, and maybe you can take the test too. How many of you had camel yesterday? Or badger, rock badger, hare, rabbit? Uh, pig, pork. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, uh, that's that kind of gets through the, the 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 meats, but then we move on to the fish course, and uh, uh, the guideline is the only clean stuff has uh, fins and scales, except in Baltimore, where Doris Lipman says uh, crab is kosher in her series of mysteries. In Baltimore, you have to eat crab, right? But those of us who love lobster or things, we're just, I had shrimp last night. I confess, I confess. That's why we begin with confession, so that we can begin being forgiven of these, our sins and offenses. But then also you have to be attentive to your poultry diet. Anybody here have uh, eagle last night? Uh, or maybe uh, vulture or osprey or uh, buzzard? No, 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 no. Nighthawk, seagull, uh, how about cormorant? Or the great owl or the little owl or maybe the stork or heron? How about a bat? Anybody have a good bat last night? Um, or maybe in the insect realm, the rule of thumb is that you may eat uh, the locust, you can eat the cricket, you can eat grasshoppers, uh, things that have joints and feet are okay, but mosquitoes are out, things like that. Anybody worried about their, their, their insect diet? By these you shall become unclean. Whoever touches the carcass of any of them shall be unclean until the evening. Whoever carries any part of the carcass of any of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. Maybe that's how this man in the temple became unclean. There are other ways in Leviticus that it happens. If you touch blood, Leviticus is enormously concerned about blood, it, particularly if you're a woman. In the Jewish tradition, that women who, when they've had their monthly period, have to go through a ritual process of bathing, and there's a bathhouse that is collected with rainwater through a cistern that they bathe, women bathe themselves in, and it takes a week, it takes a week to be purified after touching blood. And, and if you're a man who's touched a menstruating woman or a woman after childbirth, if woman gives birth to a boy, she has a week of purification rites to go through. If it's a girl, it's two weeks. I don't know why they make these things up, but the, the two weeks for there. Uh, now, you, we can laugh at that perhaps, except uh, they didn't have latex gloves. Uh, they don't have the things that we do to avoid touching blood because it may be a bearer of some kind of communicable disease, we're told. Or it could be that if you touch a, a dead body, uh, that, that is a big no-no. You, if you're going to stay clean, never touch a dead body. As somebody who has touched dead bodies to anoint them, uh, this gets my attention. But, uh, and, and if those of us who paid attention to that, if that the Ebola crisis started with a woman who kissed a corpse. Maybe there's some wisdom in this stuff about things that you do to avoid becoming unclean, whether it's something you eat or something that, that you touch, that you carry with you. And there are consequences of those things that get carried down into, into life. And some of these things are so hard uh, I, I think about food. How easy is it for you to change your diet, to get rid of carbohydrates, uh, fats, cholesterol, 
uh, to do those things that maybe your doctor tells you you should do, or other habits, the things to which you are addicted or habituated, the, the drinking, the, the drugs, the, the things that are, we read about in the press, but I was even listening to a, a psychologist talking about addictions to anger. If you know what it is to have a compelling, compulsive thing that you do in your life and you do it over and over and over again, maybe you begin to understand why when this, when this unclean spirit was pulled out of this man that he went spasmodic. The, the word root is also similar to epilepsy, that, that the reaction to Jesus, and the, the reaction, why are you coming to us? We don't want you to come to us. We like our stuff. We like it. So why are you coming and, and, and pulling this out? And Jesus, uh, and Jesus is there, the Holy One, the one who's set aside, who is pure and clean, the one of God who comes and pulls out this, this spirit. It may be that uh, some of us know how hard it is to be cleansed of our habits, cleansed of our favorite foods, cleansed of our addictions. But maybe it's Paul who really is speaking to all of us in this community when, when he goes and he's talking about knowledge and God walking one's way through what as you come to know things, he says, uh, all of us possess knowledge. Is there anyone here who doesn't possess knowledge? And we know, we prize our knowledge, I suspect, our expertise, the things that we have come to know. And there's nothing more irritating than to do something that you know is wrong or based on bad information. Uh, the poll yesterday saying now the majority of Americans acknowledge that uh, global warming is actually a, a risk factor in our society. The majority for the first time. Something that some people say, we know this is happening, and yet people keep resisting what we're doing. And so Paul, in talking about, uh, about food, the custom in, in that day was that the, where, the, where meat was a rarity, a scarcity, it was something that was expensive and reserved mostly for the rich, was something that, that came out of the pagan temples in Corinth where he was writing to, where, they, uh, where in the sacrificial process, uh, the sacrifices were great. It always reminds me of an Argentine asado where the first course you take out the sweet parts, and what are the sweet parts? It's the kidneys and the, and the intestines and the liver and all those, the heart. That's the first course, and that would be the first course. Those, when they talk about the beautiful fragrance ascending to God, that's what they're talking about. And then, and then they move on to tender pieces. And what do they do with the rest? And, and it's a sitting around thing. You sit around and you eat these things as part of the ritual process, and all the leftovers go to the market by the temple where you're worshiping. And there they're available for sale for anybody who wants to buy them. And the question comes up, should Christians be eating the stuff that's sold out of the pagan temple? Well, Paul says, well, we know, we know that it's okay. You, it, we know whether you're, whether you're a vegetarian, vegan, carnivore, pescivore, whatever you are, it's all okay. We know that because those gods aren't real. If you read what Rashad read, those gods aren't real. We know they don't really exist because there's only one God and only one Lord. And so the idea that some food is tainted because of its association with something else that doesn't really exist, we know that, that we can freely participate in that marketplace and eat and consume what we get out of it we know that, but the problem is some people don't know that, he says. The problem is that there are people who, who grew up in this culture, and, and when you take food out of the temple, whether you purchase that food, they're assuming that you're actually participating and endorsing participation in this false worship. And sometimes, because you do that, because you know so much, they feel that they can do that at putting their very souls at peril in the process. And so he says that, uh, you know, your knowledge, 
isn't the most important thing. What you know is not the most important thing. What's most important, if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to the idols? When you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. If food is the cause of their falling, don't eat it. Don't eat it, he says, because that's on you. That's on you. Now, I've been thinking about this text for about 40 years. I don't like it. I struggle with that because I suspect I'm like most of you, if not all of you. I value what I know. And if I think pragmatically this works, that doesn't work, this is not a big deal, why should I, why should I defer to somebody who's just acting out of ignorance or out of something that they don't know? And why should I let that be imposed on me and on us? And then I realize why it is this man of the unclean spirit found it so hard, so painful, so treacherous to have that spirit pulled out of him, the spirit that would put himself above the other people around him for whatever reason, that somehow would impact that community in a way that would be damaging and hurtful, because that's what happens. After those people go through, somebody has to clean up the mess they leave behind. That's the impact that the tainted spirit brought into that synagogue, that somebody else was left to clean up the consequence of that person just touching things, because just the touch of the tainted spirit was enough to do damage. Is this gospel? Well, is it? Calling upon us to live lives that embody this love for the other that is willing to defer the imposition of our wills upon them as free choice, as our choice. The ability to do that, just the ability to do that, becomes a gift from God. One of my favorite rabbinic sayings is the way you tell the difference between a dog and a human being is when you put a, food, a bowl of food in front of your dog, it can't wait, it can't stop to give thanks. It dives in. But the person has the ability to check themselves, to acknowledge God as part of their equation, and to defer, to defer something more important to what their impulse drives them to do. Paul says, food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. Don't abuse your freedom to impose damaging things on the people around you. The flip side is the gospel. Don't permit others to impose their knowledge upon you when it clearly does damage as well. Tough lesson today. You thought it was going to be easy? Eh. But the good news is we find our way through it all because God comes with us and sometimes pulls us out of our ruts and takes us to new places. And that is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God.